It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Nathan Hill, who is a professor of Chinese at Trinity College Dublin, having previously been a Troad for a number of years. Now, I don't think at this seminar we've had a, a talk on evil in old Chinese before. Well, I'm not that I remember, anyway, but, uh, but um, Nathan is a very well known uh, historical linguist. So we're very pleased that you've been talking. Yeah, about that. I would say you're an expert on many things, including old Tibetan. So uh, the paper has broadly speaking two halves, and you will notice because the first half I will be doing ad lib, but then the second half it becomes a bit more explicitly polemical. I will actually read my text. So uh, first, I'm going to just avoid Chinese altogether and uh, look at correspondences between Tibetan and Burmese uh, that motivate the reconstruction of uvulars in whatever their, uh, you know, common ancestor was, which maybe we'll call Sino-Tibetan for now. So there are two correspondences between uh, Tibetan and Burmese. One, uh, we have a healer in, in both languages, and one we have a velar in Tibetan, and we have a zero initial, probably articulated with a lot of stuff uh, in Old Burmese. And I think that other things being equal, the typical way you would address a correspondence like this is you would reconstruct the the velars that are velars like in both languages to a velar, uh, and you would reconstruct the Dealer zero alternation to something else. Yeah. And how about a uvular? Because it's quite um, normal for uvulars to turn into velars. It's also quite normal for uvulars to turn into log stuff. So now we've reconstructed a dealer uvular opposition for uh, the common ancestor of Tibetan and Burmese. Uh, but let's look at some data. Okay. So uh, we have the word for bitter with both uh, velars in, in both languages. Uh, we have uh, burden or load in Tibetan, uh, which uh, I'll just say, none of these cognitive proposals come from me. They're kind of widespread in the literature. So that's compared to saddle frame in Burmese. Uh, and then we have uh, kidney and or, uh, I don't, Actually, use this word, so I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Rains. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and then loin or waist in, in, in Burmese. Oppose, contradict in Tibetan, uh, and block or obstruct in Burmese. Uh, and then hill in both languages, and uh, the first person singular pronoun uh, in both languages. Now, looking at this, you may have some questions about uh, details. Uh, which I'm basically going to not go into, um, <laughs> but I will just say that the main phonemic opposition in uh, Tibetan is voice versus voiceless, so you can just ignore the aspiration. And um, in, in Burmese, on the other hand, uh, the main phonemic opposition is between uh, non-aspirated and aspirated, and there are no voiced consonants in inherited Burmese vocabulary. So that simplifies the picture, uh, but then you'll still say, okay, but uh, in the word for hill, uh, for instance, uh, Tibetan has a voiced uh, initial and Burmese has an aspirate, which would probably go back to a voiceless. So there's still some work to be done there. Uh, and then you can start telling stories like, well, the, the aspiration or, or the voicelessness it's conditioned by the S prefix or what have you, um, but it's a mess. One, one way or another, manner correspondences even Cyber Tibetan uh, are messy, and uh, there's a big chunk of my 2019 book that lays out, uh, you know, that mess, uh, and it's it's messy because so much of the morphology in uh, probably in the Proto language and certainly in many of the daughter languages is prefixal. So if you have a lot of prefixal morphology, you'll get messy uh, initial manner correspondences. There's a lot of work there to be done, and you know, if you uh, some weekend are not sure how to spend, you know, 
Um, <laughs> okay, so so that was it for velars and you know let's say yeah it's pretty simple got velars in both languages. Okay, so now let's look at the uvular examples. We've got a needle in um, in both languages, home in both languages, and and I'll say I particularly like this cognate because. Um, you know, needle could be, probably is, in fact, maybe a loan word of on the board. Um, but home is probably older, yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, to fasten or suffocate a card with to squeeze. And I'll just point out that this ach uh, rhyme goes back to ik. That's a normal sound change in Burmese. So it looks, it, it is better than it looks. Uh, this comparison of blood and ashamed. Is actually one of my proposals, and uh, let's say the only person who's taken notice of it is Guillaume Jacques, and he rejects it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it works in the phonology. It's like, uh, like I think it works in the phonology, and I think it's very easy to imagine red uh, having. You know, I think the semantics work and the phonology works. So uh, the reason that Guillaume rejects it is basically he wants to do other things with. Uh, the Burmese word, yeah. And then uh, this space or opening. So again, you just say that this is, uh, it, it, it looks like there was a thing that was turned into a, a velar in uh, Tibetan and is just lost in, uh, in Burmese. And luckily, because it's just lost in Burmese, this question of the manner of correspondences doesn't arise. Uh, okay, so so you know so far so good. We've got velars and we've got uvulars in uh, Sino Tibetan. Some people in the field would say, yeah, but it's very artificial. If you chose two other languages to start with, you would maybe end up with different results. And I think that's true. But so what? Like we need to start from somewhere, and starting with you know two old literary languages is a normal thing to do. They are they are not particularly closely related. Now let's add Chinese into the picture. And here I'm just sort of mechanically saying like, well, I've already given you the cognate sets. Like, are, can we put Chinese edema into those uh, sets? So uh, we generally can, yeah. So, uh, it, it, so first let's go through the velars. Yeah, so uh, we add a uh, Chinese word for bitter. We add a Chinese word for carry, uh, and then you say, what's this H with the little thing under it? Uh, that is a symbol. I'm using my system for writing Middle Chinese. <laughs> uh, and if you want to know about it, you can read an article where I lay it out. But this is a, a, a voice field fricative, uh, and everyone agrees that one of its sources, maybe it has multiple sources, uh, is a a, a go, just a, a voice velar stop. Yeah. So uh, you can look at it and think that it could look up. Okay. So then we have uh, kidney and uh, and then you know in Tibetan we add liver uh, for Chinese. We have this uh, oppose or obstruct, and we add shield or ward off in Chinese. We have hill and we have a word for hill. Uh, we have the first person pronoun and we have the first person pronoun. And I, I will just point out that this ooh, this middle Chinese ooh comes from the rhyme ah. Uh, and actually, um, uh, you know, you know how uh, uh, like what what sound do sheep make in Greek, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> BB, right? Yeah. So, so in the same way, uh, in Chinese, the way that you say that you're surprised is woo woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, probably aha, right? <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, uh, yeah. So that's that's something that, that everyone also agrees on is that woo uh, comes from ah. Uh, and that rhyme is called a fish rhyme in, in middle Chinese terminology. Uh, and uh, for instance, the word for fish in, it's, uh, in uh, Mandarin Chinese 
uh, and the Tibetan word for fish is nya, the Burmese is nga. Okay, so uh, now I've convinced you that the, the vowels work. So I've added the Chinese data into the Wheeler correspondences, and lo and behold, they're Wheeler. So now we can be, you know, more happy with having reconstructed Wheelers for uh, proto sign Tibetan. Well, now let's look at the uvulars. So uh, we add a uh, needle and we get chim. Okay, so this has some problems. Uh, we have a ma instead of a pa, that's the big problem. Uh, and then we have a chi where we want something other than a palatal. <laughs> uh, but uh, in old Chinese, the palatals have two sources. Uh, one is uh, dentals and one is uh, velars. Uh, the velars palatalize very early and then later dentals palatalize. Um, and uh, with, with velars, the conditioning environment is a little bit uh, insecure, but it won't uh, surprise you that the, the vowel I is one of the uh, places. Here, I think we reconstruct usually a schwa. So the Chinese would be something like kum. So it's not a great comparison, and that's one reason why I think maybe uh, it's a bond of one. And I, I think, although I really don't know about these things, uh, that other language families in the area like Dongmian and Pradai have similar words for needle. But of course, they just couldn't borrow it from Chinese. Yeah. Anyway, needle's a problem, uh, but I'm not going to put too much weight on it. So if you don't like it, throw it away. <laughs> uh, okay, then house. And... Uh, this one, I really like this comparison comes from Laurent Cigar. Uh, so, so it means subterranean room and it refers to, um, it's actually, I, I, I read this, this book about um, uh, records of the Inquisition in France in the 14th century. And, and at the time the French lived in, like in that part of France, at least in the Southeast, they lived in this kind of house. It's like, half underground where you sort of dig a round hole and then you put a roof over it yeah so uh that's what this means specifically and you know i don't know what kind of house the photo sign depends lived in but uh it seems like this is probably you know the maybe the inherited word for house in chinese and that uh another word for house is is means you know maisonette or something like that <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so uh, so I think that's a really nice etymology, and then you would see it like for me, it has a zero initial. Okay, uh, and then uh, for for squeeze, you say that looks like a totally random uh, word to have chosen, uh, but uh, it, it, it it can come from x in in old Chinese, and that again is uncommon word that. That um, basically what happens is uh, the KS, uh, the, the K drops out, uh, and then you get blah, blah, S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the S changes into a high tongue. Yeah. So, uh, right. And then we have uh, this word red or fiery uh, that basically gives me exactly what I want uh, for, for my comparison in this in this last example. And then I'll just say that this a vowel oh, is something like hag. Uh, everyone agrees that one of its sources is ra. So we can we can we can temporarily reconstruct something like ra. Uh, no problem. Yeah. The, this is this H I'm using was uh, in middle Chinese a voiceless velar fricative. And the origins of the voiceless velar fricative is a serious problem for old Chinese, but uh, you know I, I feel like this pocket is good enough that I'm allowed to keep it for now. Yeah, and uh, for now I would just point out that none of these reflexes are the same as the ones in the, the velar cases, except maybe for needle. But 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 even let's say just at face value, even needle has a different outcome than. Uh, the velars that you were looking at earlier, right? So that suggests to me that that we do need some kind of velar versus something else distinction uh, in Old Chinese. Even if you are happy to throw out the first and the last example, 
then we still have two quite good correspondences. And you know, maybe some people would say you shouldn't build the phonology of a proto language just on the basis of the two examples. And I would say, well, well, then you and I disagree. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the whole point is uh, sound change is exceptionless. So if it works, uh, go with it. That's my feeling. I mean, I'm happy to build the case for uvulars uh, entirely on the basis of these two examples. Uh, I'm happy to say I don't think I need to do that. But I, but if I did need to do that, I would be okay with that. Okay, so I haven't so far made the case for reconstructing uvulars in the history of Chinese. Uh, on any Chinese internal ground, yeah, and that's uh, you know that's the way I'm trying to sort of structure this this paper is to say, look, we need velars and uvulars before we get to Chinese. So then the question isn't you know whether or not there were uvulars in the history of Chinese. We know there were uvulars in the history of Chinese. The question is what happened to the uvulars and when did they become something else? We also know that. Uh, they did become something else because there aren't uvulars in Chinese today, right? So it's a question of when, it's not a question of whether. And now the question is, did old Chinese have uvulars? Well, some people say that old Chinese did have uvulars. So now I'm going to present that Chinese internal case for uvulars. All right, so uh, to start with, just some basics about how the Chinese writing system works. So some Chinese characters are logograms like uh, the word for horse is a picture of a horse. And uh, in an earlier version of this handout, I made it very big so you could see it, uh, but it took up too much room, so I made it small again. But if you turn your handout sideways and squint, you can say, yeah, it looks like a horse. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, they, they, they didn't turn it sideways. They wrote their horses like this. Like standing on their tails, yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, I I I don't have a story to tell about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so some words are like this word for horse is a picture of a horse, and you read it as your word for horse. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, most characters have two parts: one the semantic indicator and one the phonetic ind indicator. Um, so, for instance. Uh, we have this word headboard, uh, and it has the semantic tree, and it has the phonetic horse. So, uh, if, if, so that if you see this character, you will think, how am I supposed to read it? Well, it's either a, a word that has something to do with horses and is pronounced like tree, or <laughs> it's a word that... Uh, has something to do with wood and is pronounced like horse. And then you say, oh, it must be headboard because headboard is pronounced the same way as horse. Yeah, that's the way the script works. Uh, at least, you know, if we're imagining the early days of the elaboration of the script, and I'll just point out it's exactly the same as Sumerian. Yeah. The way Sumerian is different than from Chinese is that Chinese came up with the clever idea of, of always having the logogram fit inside a box. Yeah, whereas in Sumerian, you can kind of just jumble these phonetic and semantics around and uh, get kind of long stuff. I mean, I don't even know what to call it. Like, like we would say in a Sanskrit uh, context, aksharas, but that's not quite right either. Yeah. Um, but uh, you can have, you know, you have these little graphic components, phonetics and semantic determiners, and you can pile them up. Uh, you can pile them up in Sumerian, you can pile them up in Chinese. In Chinese, that stack always has to fit inside a box. That was not true in Oracle Bones. But by the time you get to the Zhou dynasty, someone had this idea of, oh, you should have um, the characters all be the same size, no matter how complex they are. So for the purposes of historical chronology, that means we have a huge uh, pool of information, although how to use it is quite uh, tricky, uh, where you know we know that horse and headboard must have sounded somehow alike, maybe not the same, right? So, what are the parameters of phonetic similarity that uh, permit you to use this? Is called the Rebus principle, right? It's like 
is like on uh, that. God, there was some game show uh, on TV when I was a kid uh, that I don't remember the name of, where where they would draw pictures and you would have to guess the sentence. Yeah, and so they would like always use an eyeball for the word for the first person. Yeah, that's the Rebus principle. So what is the scope of phonetic similarity uh, that the script has in mind for application of the Rebus principle? It's just important to sort of get out of the way that probably in reality, different people at different times had different phonetic criteria for their application of the Rebus principle. But uh, if that's our understanding, we will get nowhere. I just say, well, you know, some people probably did it differently at different times. Then uh, we can't use this evidence for research. So instead, it's useful to articulate some hypothesis of what those parameters of phonetic similarity uh, were. And, uh, and I will get to that in just a moment. Uh, but first, I will just introduce the term Sheshon series. The Sheshon series is uh, a, a suite of Chinese characters that share the same phonetic. So I give one here for you. So, um, so you can look at it. Yeah. So we have the kind of mother character, which is the logograph. So it's, it has no uh, semantic determiner. It it it's like your picture for words. It's it's just a symbol that stands for a word, and then you have all of the characters that are sort of born from it. And I have a a way to transliterate this that's inspired by how things are done in the Near East, uh, where I write the for instance the mother character in this case I write it as a pa, and then I continue to write it as a pa. Uh, as an indication of the pronunciation in all the other characters, that's transcribing the phonetic determiner in those characters. Uh, but then I use a sort of truncated Latin uh, abbreviation for the semantics. Yeah, so the first one is vest pa, that means it was pronounced like pa and it had something to do with clothing. Then uh, I have Tum pa, that uh, means it was pronounced something like pa, and it had something to do with a mound. Yeah, so uh, if you know Chinese, which some of you do, you'll, I think, see what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, and I think it would be really nice if other people did it this way, because then people who don't know Chinese characters could make sense of arguments about Chinese is world phonology in the way that happens in the study of Sumerian and, and Hittite and whatnot. Uh, but uh, let's say everyone who knows any Chinese who has seen this thinks I've absolutely lost my mind. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, anyhow, uh, and I have an article, quite old one now, where I lay out this Sort of system, and then you see you have two systems, two nascent systems next to each other. Right? <laughs> the first one is how I transliterate the character. That's the point. It's not a reconstruction, it's a transliteration. Uh, and then the second one is the middle Chinese pronunciation. The middle Chinese pronunciation uh, is attested. Okay, it's not attested in Roman letters. We would need a lot of time to talk about what's going on here with, with this Romanization. But it is attested. There's a book from 602 that systematically represents the pronunciation of about 9,000 characters. So you can understand this as that's how it's philologically attested in 602. And, and uh, I have a transcription relying on Baxter's transcription. And sort of, I've cleaned it up to make it more indological because that's how my brain works. Uh, and it uh, represents the attested pronunciation from 602. So you have an attested pronunciation from 602 in, in italics and a transliteration of the structure of the character uh, in not italics. Okay, so now you know what a Sheshan series is. So any observations about uh, how similar uh, the pronunciation of a word has to be in order to warrant being written with the same phonetic and don't look at the handout 
<laughs> for the answer, anyone? Anyone? Just go or, or you look at the hand up, but just the don't turn up the don't look at the answer at the bottom of the page. Yes. Any any observations? What do these have in common? Pierre and Pierre and Pierre. Place of articulation. Pardon? Place of articulation. Place of articulation. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, now let's look at the. I don't know the 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 outslaw. Do we have uh, do we have uh, Bic and you know Pong and whatnot in this series? No, no, no. yeah, no. So so there's so so the the initials have to have the same place of articulation, and there's some kind of constraint operating on the on the codas. Uh, you would say, well, they're not all the same rhyme. But actually, it's it's only two, and um, that probably re reflects a, a late split. So probably in old Chinese, they had the same uh, rhyme, uh, and you'll notice that the I write an I before the E in half of them. That's a kind of orthographic convention. We don't exactly know how it was uh, pronounced. So in old Chinese, there were two. Types of syllables, which you call type A and type B. So in this case, uh, we have type A R and type B F. So uh, we can hypothesize that whatever the type A B distinction originally was in uh, probably the kind of middle of the Han Dynasty, it conditioned some kind of big vowel change. So that's why we have this uh, these two uh, different rhymes. And in general, it's always two. Yeah. You, 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 you have a station series, it's long and short. Uh, it might be only one. It might be that that, that particular station series is all type A character. Uh, but it, it never has, you know, 10 different vowels. It's always one or two. So uh, we can hypothesize that in all Chinese, there's always one. Yeah, okay. Now, what doesn't it re re uh, represent? Well, even here we see that it doesn't, uh, that we, we, we're in different acetone. Yeah. We can say uh, the tone doesn't matter, and the manner of articulation doesn't matter. One uh, thing that was fun about the uh, the, the chapter uh, with James was we talked about methodology of historical linguistics, right? and um, the Baxter and Cigar see themselves as parians, where you have a hypothesis and then you uh, look for evidence to refute that hypothesis. And I don't think that this is a good philosophy of science, uh, and and I. Uh, I'm going to promote the exact opposite. So his is called uh, hypothetical deductive, uh, and I'm going to call mine empirico dogmatic. So, uh, so the empirico is we look at something and we see a pattern, yeah, and then the dogmatic is I I'm committed to this pattern now, yeah. So I have to continue to see this pattern even when. The evidence contradicts it. Yeah. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's what I call the the um, the empirical dogmatic method. And I, and I think all major uh, successes in uh, historical linguistics have come with this method. Think about uh, Dave Sosora and the Laryngeals. You can think of it that way. You know, he noticed a pattern, and then he saw the pattern even when it seemed not to be there. Yeah. So I'm going to. Now apply that uh, method, and in this case, uh, we'll call it the Shechen hypothesis, where the Shechen hypothesis is: if two words are written with characters that share the same phonetic, then they would have had the same place of articulation uh, for their initials and the same rhyme for their finals. And uh, if I find a Shechen series that appears to violate that. Uh, that's my problem. I need to fix it. Okay, so now let's look at one such uh, style of violation of the Shechen hypothesis. There are various phenomena which are basically types of viol apparent violations of the Shechen hypothesis. So now we're going to look at one particular phenomenon, uh, which I would, uh, you know, in the tradition of naming things after people, I would call Pons phenomenon. So in Pons phenomenon, we have contact 
between velars and we call them laryngeals in uh, in Chinese studies and, and don't put any particular stock in that choice of words, okay? <laughs> but you'll see that it's not a natural clap. The glottal stop, a ya, the voiceless velar fricative. Yeah, so so we have we have contact between velars and other stuff. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's look at it. So in the first, so in example one, now now just head straight to the examples, the dotted examples. In the same series, you see we have a velar, a glottal stop, a voice uh, velar fricative, and a voice listener. Uh, in example two, we have uh, an aspirate uh, velar stop and a ya. In example three, we've got glottal stop, we've got initial wa. Well, with the glottal stop. Anyhow, you get the idea. We 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 have things that are not homoorganic in Middle Chinese. So, uh, in Baxter and Cigar's theory, there are the sound changes that you see immediately after the name of the example. So, for instance, that a, a voiceless uvular becomes a glottal stop. Uh, that an aspirate uvular uh, becomes a velar fricative. That a, a voiced uh, uvular stop becomes a voiced uvular, sorry, voiced velar fricative, but only in type A syllables. So, yeah, you, you know, I just commend you to the study of uh, these sound changes uh, for the time being and say these are the proposals that Baxter and Cigar make to fix these broken Shenzhen series. And this is the dogmatic component. We say, okay. They they violate the Shishan hypothesis, but if I believe this, they don't anymore. Okay, so so far so good. We we preserved our Shishan hypothesis yeah, from this potential attack. Yeah, not quite so easy because you notice that the the hypotheses are all about explaining the non velars as coming from uvulars. But these series also have velars in them. Yeah. <laughs> so if I have a series that has some uvulars and some velars, it's still a violation of the Shayshan hypothesis. So now I also need a theory about how the velars got in these series. Yeah. So far, sort of examples one, two, three, four are about how the laryngeals come from uvulars. Now I also need some of the velars to come from uvulars. And Baxter and Cigar's uh, proposal which is quite mechanical, but not implausible pathologically, is that there was a prefix that uh, protected, if you like, the, or, or it, it conditioned a bleeding relationship, right? So, so uh, if I had a Q, it, it sort of wanted to turn into a glow stop, but if I have a prefix in front of it, then it doesn't, it, it changes into a bleeding. So, it's perfectly reasonable, although a little bit uh, formalistic. Uh, now, in many cases, for particular etymologies, they do have a story about what the prefix was. Oh, here it was a T, here it was a B. Uh, but uh, uh, that involves all sorts of things that I don't want to touch on. And is definitely one of the most controversial parts of their reconstruction system that they do sort of use as a skeleton key to solve all problems. So here I'll just say, you know, well, you know, it, it, we, we can do it uh, by just saying, yeah, there was a conditioning environment that meant some of the uvular uh, determined to be those. Now, it, it still, let's say, has a, a kind of uh, real utility in terms of Shechong theory because there should be, because let's say we have this hypothesis now that there are two kinds of velars, right, in middle Chinese. There are the velars that come from velars, and there are the velars that come from uvulars. And now we would expect that those behave differently, for instance, in um, in uh, in terms of what cognates they have uh, in, in other languages. Uh, but also potentially, you know, if, if they were actually, if, the, if this is true, 
then you would expect there to be philological evidence also that they were different. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Okay, so now is when I switch to reading the paper. So uh, this is the first set of conclusions and the first half of the paper. Uh, the reconstruction of a velar versus uvular opposition may be posited purely on the basis of a correspondence between Tibetan and Burmese. Once this reconstruction is made, the fate of uvulars in Old Chinese requires some kind of account. The null hypothesis would be that Sino-Tibetan velars persisted as velars in the Old Chinese, and that likewise Sino-Tibetan uvulars persisted as uvulars. It may be the case that the evidence in favor of this null hypothesis is so far uh, not overwhelming, uh, but this is not a particularly germane objection because it's the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis gets the benefit of the doubt. Uh, in any event, because uvulars are already required in Sinus Tibetan on grounds unrelated to Chinese, one cannot dismiss uh, the reconstruction of uvulars within the history of Chinese by brandishing hot and great. You can't say, oh, don't give me uvulars. You, you need the uvulars. So now uh, the, the problem is that Axel Schussler doesn't buy this. So now I'm going to look at what does Axel Schussler say and what do I have to say about it. So uh, if we look at the treatment of a few Sheshong series in the hands of Schussler, and that is minimal Old Chinese written OCM, and in the hands of Baxter and Cigar, which is new Old Chinese NOC, um, it's pretty clear that Baxter and Cigar's reconstruction satisfy the Sheshan hypothesis better. Now, you know, that's maybe Axel Schuttler would say that's because they, you know, stop at nothing to, <laughs> to satisfy the Sheshan hypothesis. But let's just say as a starting point, you know, we all use the Sheshan hypothesis and they stop at nothing and manage to, to get there, whereas he stops the first time he trips over a pebble in the road and he doesn't get there. And uh, this is in uh, table one, uh, where I've broken it into, what is it, one, two, three, four, five different theories, and you can just look at Baxman's cigars reconstruction and Schuttler's reconstruction. And I think that the second chunk is where it's most striking, where, uh, you know, uh, for OCM, we have clone, clone, own, long. These things just basically have nothing to do with each other in terms of initiative. Yeah. Whereas it's, it's lovely if ornate uh, or Baxter and Cigars uh, reconstruction. Okay, so I would say prima facie, you know, we should say, good job, Baxter and Cigar, you have stuck with the Shazer uh, and And uh, Schussler correctly characterizes the advantages of the usual approach, namely this, uh, this interference of laryngeal in uh, velar series. So that's point A. Point B, the failure of certain middle Chinese homophon groups to overlap in the writing of exclamated texts is basically we expect certain kinds of spelling mistakes if two things are pronounced the same. You know, like we could say, for instance, knight uh, with a K and knight without a K. Uh, we would expect at some point to get mixed up if in fact they were pronounced the same. And, and we have cases where it doesn't happen. In particular, these two things, gong, and I don't have a good way to read them out loud, but let's say one is maybe gong uncle, I'll call it, and one is gong work. So uh, Baxman's bar say, they don't get confused. So they were probably pronounced differently. Uh, so Schuchler acknowledges that, and he also um, mentions that there's foreign transcription evidence in favor of the uvular hypothesis, and I'll look at these three types of evidence. But nonetheless, Schussler rejects the uvular hypothesis. So we'll look at uh, these three types of evidence and what he says. So first, contact between velars and laryngeals, which was the reason that I motivated the, the reconstruction of uh, uvular in the history of Chinese. So Schussler makes an effort to defend his belief that phonetic series are an unreliable kind of evidence which can be overlooked when it's convenient. I'm quoting Baxter and Suma there. Um, so now I'll just read this long quote uh, from Schuttler. He says, Old Chinese rhymes 
uh, with many words and graphs that to say you know I have a lot of, I stumble over that every time rhymes with I think we're talking about poetry that's not what's happening yet right <laughs> it's old Chinese rhymes that have yeah many words and graphs like ah have ample graphic elements available to keep words with initial velars uh, clusters and glottal stop separate so that k and glottal stop do not need to mix thus we have uh, this series ka which writes only uh, velars and then we have uh, ja and ja that write clusters like kra uh, and then we have uh, this this ka uh, that writes well, stop initial. So in this case, we've got lots of different series. We can make very fine-grained phonetic distinctions. On the other hand, rhymes like up with relatively few words have correspondingly fewer graphemes at their disposal. There is no phonemic, sorry, there's no phonetic series that's no Shishong series um, up. So the few words of this shape are slipped into other series. Once it was done, occasional mixes of velars and individuals were accepted. So it's a, I want to emphasize a two-part story. I have to do something for pragmatic reasons, and then I allow myself to do it in other circumstances. So Baxter and Cigar agree with Schussler that some phonetic series were exceptionally pressed into service to write rare syllable types, a phenomenon that they dubbed faute de mieux phonetics. But they reject Schussler's contention that these uh, full the mere phonetics were precedent setting for more common simple types. So this is what they say. They say the preference for optimal phonetics is local in scope, that a word pronounced as up could be written with a faute de mieux cup phonetic did not undermine the entire system, i.e., did not result in a phonetic, for example, con becoming acceptable way of indicating the pronunciation on when there were already phonetics uh, for on uh, exi that existed. Sorry, I'm not reading the quote very well. So Schuttler's uh, notion that any phonetic contact that can occur when one is hard pressed for an appropriate phonetic then gives rise to precedence for similar contacts in more common syllable types leads inexorably to a testable prediction. Such contact should start in rare syllables uh, and then spread in the course of uh, younger character coinages. Yeah, so, so some characters are older than others, yeah, are invented at different times. So these contacts should spread through time to more and more common syllable types. Schussler offers no discussion of the relative chronology of the character coinages uh, in question. Uh, so he doesn't, you know, so there's a, pr there's a prediction and he doesn't uh, say anything about whether uh, the evidence is in his favor or not. And Baxter Cigar say it's not. So this is what they said. They say, in fact, throughout the old Chinese period, the match between the system of phonetics and the language's phonology did not fade as Schussler's model would predict. It grew stronger to the point that towards the end of the period, the system of phonetic had become a near syllabary. Warren State's scribes writing on bamboo slips, slips kept phonetic elements relatively stable, while semantic determinatives could vary from one token to the next, even under the same hand. Referring to the data in the first two rows of Table 1, Schussler contends that ang, shadow shade, and kang, right, are not derived from the same root, but an example of a popular mental connection between graphs that has nothing to do with etymology. The reader is left to wonder how Schussler has gained direct access to the inner lives of the ancients. <laughs> Baxter and Cigar point out that in early texts, both words are written with the same character, a fact that by itself thwarts Schussler's account, since the rebus pr principle is only available when two words have similar enough pronunciations. So quietism is the only disposition to the contact of velars and laryngeals in phonetic series 
that Schuttler will countenance. As such, in his discussion of the history of the proposal, he scolds Pon and Baxter for upturning his apple cart. Inconsistently, he makes fun of Pon for restraint and then immediately mocks Baxter and Cigar for their chutzpah. Baxter's openness to revising his thinking in the course of 22 years of additional study, Schuttler also ridicules. So let's uh, see him do these things. Uh, Pond postulates uvular stops to explain co-occurrences with velar stops. Although one may wonder how uh, K uh, Q contact works better than blah stop K contact that was accepted until recently by scholars, including Baxter, and has felt natural to native writers since Han times at least. But unlike Pond, Baxter and Cigar require distinct velar and uvular uh, series which neutralizes Pond's original rationale for uvulars, which was precisely the coincidence of the two manner series, velars and uvulars, in phonetic series. This should have been the end of the thought. <laughs> but theories have a way of getting divorced from their raison d'etre and taking on a life of their own. Baxter and Cigar now use uvulars to claim old Chinese distinctions among Middle Chinese velars. The transition from, this is me now, right? Uh, the transition from Pons to Baxter and Cigar's proposal is not a story of a hypothesis losing touch with its raison d'etre, but rather of a raison d'etre finding more adequate fulfillment in a revised hypothesis. The raison d'etre of the uvular hypothesis is to bring the Shesham series that mix uvulars and laryngeals into conformity with the Shesham hypothesis. The formulation of Pan falls short of this, but the formulation of Baxter and Cigar achieves it. As Baxter and Cigar point out, other major advances in our understanding of old Chinese onsets have followed exactly the same reasoning. And in those cases, Schussler forsakes his quietism. The mixing of nasals with voiceless, voiceless stops or fricatives in a phonetic series is no less or no more a violation of the Shaqing hypothesis than the mixing of K and blah, blah, blah. I haven't given these examples, but uh, you have series that mix ta and na, for instance. Uh, but whereas Schussler is content to eliminate the former by reconstructing voiceless nasals, that's what most of the field does, he balks at reconstructing uvulars to explain the latter. Why not propose that it is the lack of appropriate phonetics for a syllable such as T that led the desperate ancients to take recourse to the character knee ear uh, to write uh, a word like P, shame, or disgrace uh, before one turns to a non synodic sound such as no. And there I'm non synodic is a term that he uses for you. He thinks like I need to <laughs> so that was it for the the, the, the mixing of laryngeals and, and velars. Now the non-contact of apparently homophonous phonetics. Schussler admits that the failure of apparently homophonic uh, phonetics to be found in spelling variation of the same word, the term for this kind of spelling variation in Chinese is tongjia, uh, is in need of explanation. And I'll say. He's going further there than some of the critics of Baxter and Cigar. The people in Beijing should say, oh, one day we'll find a document. So Schuster says, yeah, this is a problem. Yeah. Uh, but he offers an alternative account uh, to that of the Vila versus uvula distinction proposed by Baxter and Cigar. Namely, he says that gong word was reserved for simple K words, whereas gong uh, uncle uh, had complex initials with clusters, such as the word uh, he, he translates it uncle itself, uh, which he reconstructs as Tong. So he thinks now it's not ka versus a, it's ka versus kla. Okay, in effect, Schuttler here proposes to modify the Shechen hypothesis. So here's the new Shechen hypothesis. To appear in the same Shechen series, it is not enough for initial stops to be homoorganic, but they also must be homogeneous with respect to the complexity of the initial. He would have done well to argue that a broad principle of separating simplex and complex uh, onsets into distinct series is discernible in other cases. The parameters for his revised hypothesis are also 
uh, quite unclear. Like, like he doesn't say how, like, okay, you know, he's rejecting the sort of standard JSON web office. He doesn't say that it's, his alternative is, yeah. Countless series ride roughshod over the presence or absence of a medial R. Clearly, medial R is ignored in, in Shatron theory. So why was medial L treated totally different than medial R? So Baxter and Cigar object to uh, Schussler's proposal uh, as uh, follows. The uncle phonetic itself is regarded by, that's to say, the picture, yeah? Is regarded by paleographers as the original graph for this word one, which starts with a glottal stop. Under any reconstruction system, the Middle Chinese glottal stop initial cannot reflect an old Chinese velar, uh, nor is there any known process for turning velars into glottal stops. This implies that the Middle Chinese uh, initial in uh, father prints is secondary. Yeah. They're saying. This, this, the, the character that we use to write prints was originally a, a drawing of a jar. And the word for that kind of jar starts with a glow stop. So you so your KL trick is not gonna work. <laughs> That's the, the point, yeah. So drawing together five words written with characters from the Shaitan series built on this uh, uncle uh, character, back to Cigar write as follows. And you might want to sort of look back. This is this that second chunk of table one. Yeah? So Schussler's forms close to Middle Chinese do not explain why the Gong phonetic was selected, nor do they give substance to the lexical root common to the first three items, father, father-in-law, old man, or to the last two, earth and jar, Contain. Now, I will say that Baxter and Cigar rely in this way a lot on what I call etymological speculation. It's not a term they're fond of. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, I would say sometimes it's more plausible, sometimes it's less plausible. But but if there are three words in a series that mean father, father in law, and old man that like are somehow probably pronounced very similarly, I don't think it's crazy to think that they're morphologically related, right? Um, but uh, I will admit that, that when etymological simulation becomes crazy, it's quite a hard uh, line to draw in the sand. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then they also mentioned that one of these words is respelled uh, basically after a sound change. And they say, like, well, wow, if, if, if they were sort of totally equanimous about kind of how closely uh, two things had to be pronounced to use this particular phonetic, why did they respell it after a sound change? Yeah. Okay, so um, all in all, Schuttler's alternative explanations for the absence of Tongja contact between apparently homophonous phonetics is less effective than the uvular hypothesis. That's my conclusion on his attempt to deal with the kind of gong gong problem. Okay, so now uh, on to the foreign transcription. So Baxter and Cigar appear not to have rehearsed any of the transcriptional evidence for uvulars in their own publications. But they referred to Pond 1997 and Pulley Blank 1962. The main evidence they seem to have in mind is a glottal stop appearing where other evidence points to a velar. So it's similar to what we saw in the Shisham series, but now in foreign transcription. Yeah. Such as uh, the city in Kotan written Umye in the Hanshu, but written Kumye in the Hanji. So that's the kind of evidence we're talking about. Schussler is again unimpressed. And now quoting Schussler, according to the uvular hypothesis, foreign Q becomes old Chinese Q becomes middle Chinese glottal stop. Yet, if in principle old Chinese Q can become glottal stop, then it stands to reason that a foreign Q could equally well have changed into a glottal stop earlier when entering old Chinese. So basically, a Chinese person. Uh, hear the uvular and understand it as a glottal stop is what he's saying. So these transcriptions do not support the uvular hypothesis. So I would say one can object to Schussler's alternative account by noting that the phonological substitutions acceptable in load worn phonology are not the same as those seen in sound change. So pretty obvious point. In particular, changing Q to a glottal stop is a perfectly normal sound change. But my observation, and I don't have like if you know, if you if you have more evidence for this, please give it to me. My observation is that in loanword phonology, 
uvulars tend to be substituted with velars. For instance, in English, where we have words like Quran and Qibla, where it would have been perfectly fine in English just to, to call the holy book of Islam the Quran, right? Uh, but we don't we don't do it. So now I'm sort of done with you know basically the second chunk of the paper, which is I'm not that impressed by uh, Schussler's uh, objections. Uh, so the second uh, set of conclusions, in general, Schussler's attempt to offer alternative explanations for the relevant phenomena are unconvincing. Although to the extent that they suggest a program of research, they are doubtless um, useful. Yeah, so like we should look, for instance, more systematically at these uh, at the relevant uh, foreign transcriptions. I would say. Uh, so, in one move, Baxter and Cigar explain the phenomena of laryngeal velar contact in Chesham series, the lack of Tongja contact between apparently homophonous phonetics, and the phenomena of glottal. Uh, stop appearing in the transcription of foreign words where other evidence points to a velar, whereas Schutzler requires a separate explanation for each case. So he, I mean, you haven't read his article, but he goes on and on about uvular is a violation of Occam's razor. And I just think like, okay, who's violating Occam's razor here, right? Uh, okay, so in order for Schutzler's account for laryngeal and velar contact in phonetic series to be convincing, he would need to show that both the mute phonetics uh, once established, uh, become more and more common in different syllable types. In order for uh, his argument about uh, apparent homophonous phonetics not being used uh, for each other in spelling variation, he would have to flesh out his idea that it's about uh, constant clusters rather than uvulars. And uh, and uh, I so what I want to do here is say and if he wants to prove that his account of foreign transcriptions is right he would need to blah 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 but I can't actually think of what he would do <laughs> uh, but but that may be my problem like may, maybe he can think of ways to strengthen that argument okay so then as the overall conclusion I will just uh, sort of remind you of my first set of conclusions and then uh, link the two together. Uh, when we bear in mind that uvulars must be reconstructed at the level of sign of Tibetan for reasons independent of Chinese evidence, and that at least three types of, at first blush, unrelated Chinese internal problems receive an explanation uh, with the uvular hypothesis, the coincidence that internally motivated uvulars occur exactly when we need them on uh, comparative grounds is, I think, in effect, incontrovertible uh, reason for believing. Yeah? Uh, and the sound and fury that Schuttler directs at the uvular hypothesis is merely his filial expression of a fondness for all Lang Syne. I think it's just <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's the end of my paper.